Chris Drewer. Uh, a lot of people, especially now around South Australia, are into cycling. You are far more into cycling than most people. But what came first? The Were you a, a, a big cyclist, a, a long-distance cyclist, before you took on this challenge of cycling around the world? No, well, I've, I've been on a bike for two years now, or 40,000 kilometres, but really I'm not much of a cyclist. Uh, unless I've got somewhere to go, um, I don't really uh, don my lycra and cycle around a city, um, for instance, on a Sunday morning. Um, so it was more about the travelling, really. And when I moved to England, I needed a hobby for weekends, so I bought my bike, uh, did a two-day trip, and turned that into a five-day trip on the Hadrian's Wall, turned that into a one-month trip over summer. And then I thought, well, if I can cycle for one month, why not cycle for two years? And let's face it, you are essentially coming home because you're from Sydney. That's right, yeah. yeah. I am a, I am a dual national, but so I have the UK passport and, and uh, that helped a lot uh, cycling around the Schengen region for uh, six or eight months uh, when I began the trip. So uh, yeah, um, yeah, been going, going for a while now and uh, yeah, working my way across the world and only 2,000 more kilometres to go. And you're doing it, in fact, to raise money for cancer research. Is there a, a personal aspect of this for you? Yeah, I lost my mum uh, to breast cancer when I was two years old. Um, so I'm cycling to raise money for AICR, or the Association for International Cancer Research. And at the moment, they're funding around 80, 185 projects across 19 or 20 countries. Uh, so I wanted a charity that um, isn't limited by borders and uh, you know, funds the best research across the world. And the work you're doing isn't limited by borders. As you said, with the dual nationality, the Schengen Zone, which for most people, well, most people don't know, the Schengen Zone is essentially Western Europe, the European common market, as we used to call it. So you don't have problems at the borders. But there are countries you've been to, and I'm thinking of Kazakhstan, where <laughs> fundraising cyclists are not a common sight. No, definitely not. Um, and the Kazakhs weren't particularly helpful because the dictator there at the moment decided to have a three-day holiday for his birthday and closed all the borders with China. So, of course, my uh, passport, my visa expired, so I had to turn around, hitchhike back 1,200 kilometres to Kyrgyzstan, get a new visa, come back a week later. But, of course, the guards are all bored on the border, and uh, in the meantime, they'd picked my lock and ridden around and broken a few things. Um, but these things happen, and I was able to get the new, uh, the new visa, so that was okay. Uh, probably the most difficult place but was Turkmenistan and they only uh, issue transit visas either three days or five days so you've got 570 kilometers of desert um, you know head down and pedal into the wind and hope to come out on the other side in Uzbekistan so it was a, a real adventure there camping in the uh, sand dunes and and just pushing through the winds every day. Now, we know about the dictators in that part of the world but how did the people by the side of the road re react to a, an obvious foreigner on a bicycle, <laughs> cycling head down against the wind. Yeah, well, well that's the thing. On, on the bike, uh, you're very rarely in tourist places. You spend most of the time in the, in the villages and countryside. And uh, cycling through, people were quite curious and very hospitable. Um, I know uh, in some places, you know, villagers were fighting to have the honour of hosting me or, or having me in their property. Um, through the Muslim world, uh, very hospitable through there, especially in Iran. And, uh, you know, every sunset I'll just walk up to a mosque and uh, ask to sleep on the floor. And that was quite nice, waking up to the morning prayers and, and uh, yeah, just sleeping on the carpets. Um, and then, of course, in Southeast Asia, I had all the temples or the wats. Uh, so I would um, usually have a bucket shower with the monks um, and then uh, pitch up uh, my uh, tent in the grass or, or sleep on the tem temple floor. And then in the morning, the alms giving, so the locals will come along with all sorts of food, and I'll be able to sit there having a nice, delicious breakfast. So, uh, yeah, it was, people were very friendly along the way. I think you've encouraged a lot of people to do their, their trip around Southeast Asia with a bicycle, whether or not they're <laughs> raising money for cancer. So in countries like, again, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, was there much awareness of the charitable side of what you were doing? No, well, I, I raised... Um, because I was teaching in, in Yorkshire before I left, I raised about $10,000 just before uh, even leaving the UK. Um, and then on the continent, uh, I was able to meet a lot of tourists, and that's where a lot of donations came in. have a little collection tin attached to my bicycle. But from Istanbul all the way to Darwin, uh, you know, 25,000 kilometres or so, um, you know, there's really not many opportunities to raise money. And, and in a lot of countries... Uh, with the um, disparities in wealth and, and again being out of the cities um, I would 
I was more just doing it for the adventure, and then now I'll be doing more charity events. Uh, so yesterday, for example, I visited um, uh, the Center of Cancer Biology in South Australia University and was able to meet some scientists, uh, Dr. Cameron Bracken and Dr. Joanna Woodcock, and that was really good to get an insight into the uh, cancer research here in Adelaide. Um, and in the coming weeks, I'll be visiting Melbourne, Canberra, and Sydney labs as well. And eventually you'll end up back in Sydney, where I guess your family are going... Oh, he's home now. <laughs> I think I actually I think they're sick of me. Um, my dad actually drove the three thousand k from Sydney to Darwin, so I had the support vehicle along the Stewart Highway. Uh, so that was nice, you know. I could get up before sunrise, get on the road. Dad would, um, you know, unpack the tent, load it onto the uh, bike. I'd, I'd already eaten ten wheat bix or twelve wheat bix by that stage in my tent, uh, and then he would catch up two hours later, cook about a kilogram of porridge and another coffee, um, and then onwards from there. And of course, he'll have a Weber with him and and some some other good cooking implements, and goes a lot further than my my usual MSR petrol stove. So. I'm back now to two-minute noodles and porridge, so it's going to be a, a tough trip between here and Melbourne, I think, uh, given the cuisine or lack of cuisine. Well, I was just I was about to ask you, how do you fuel a, a trip like that? So it's obviously wheat bix and porridge. Yeah, that's it's, right. It's that's the right. eternal breakfast, really. Absolutely, absolutely, especially now back in Oz. Um, yeah, I couldn't really get wheat bix overseas. Um, it was quite tough for Europe. Um, I had to be quite careful with my my budget, of course. Um, but then once I got into Iran and, and places like this, um, and especially China, I could afford local food. And, you know, the street food is much better than what you buy in proper restaurants and more likely to not make you sick. So for one one dollar or one dollar twenty, I could have, um, you know, arguably the best food in the world in Western China. So I really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, and, and the Sumatran food was also very impressive um, in Indonesia. So uh, and we all know how good Thai food tastes as well. And there were places you went to you mentioned Crete and I know that you can't actually cycle from Greece to Crete because the Mediterranean <laughs> the Aegean in fact at that point gets in the way so yeah. there was a bit of boat travel there was yeah and I mean I had the English Channel um, to tackle first but then I took a, a 9,000 kilometer detour up to the Arctic Circle so there were a lot of boats um, within the Norwegian fords and getting up from Denmark to Sweden uh, then dropping south you know Finland to uh, Estonia and then in the Mediterranean as well. Um, I actually uh, majored at university in Greco-Roman history, so I was in no rush to, uh, to leave Europe. Um, so I spent a lot of time in, in Greece and, and these parts. Um, and then, of course, the, the Silk Road. Uh, but I think from Istanbul to um, Malacca in Malaysia, I didn't have a single boat. So that was all, uh, yeah, cycling on tarmac or, uh, or dirt paths all the way across Central Asia along the Silk Road. And what sort of a bike, apart from being pretty tough, do you actually ride? Uh, it's a British company called Doors, and they specialise in tour bikes. So um, the main features of a tour bike has to have forks at the front that can hold the weight. I do have about 50 kilograms of gear across six bags, which are attached to my bicycle. Um, so a steel frame is very important as well, so I can weld it on the road when it snaps. Um, and lots of granny gears. Um, so you can imagine... Uh, the Fords in Norway or the Slovenian Alps, the Caucasus Mountains, and then those, you know, big mountain ranges off the Himalayas and China. So I needed lots of gears for those mountains that sometimes had about 28 or 30 switchbacks, um, you know, all the way up into the snow line. So I needed very low gears um, for, the, for the adventure. Granny gears. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, or low gears, if, if you prefer that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, know, I know a few grannies in their 90s who still cycle around the hills. <laughs> they are, they're, they're very tough. Now, you've done this, and obviously there must have been moments when you went, maybe I should have just stayed in Leeds and kept teaching. What kept <laughs> you going? Uh, well, I think, I, I mean... I'm a history teacher and, and uh, the influence of that, I sort of put my own life in perspective as well. And at the end of the day, um, you know, even if I began teaching now, I'll have 50 years um, before retirement. So I'm only in my 20s once. I'm healthy and young, so do it now while I can. Um, and yeah, and so whenever I was a bit down, as long as I had a good book with me, um, you know, I, I could fight through because because there were stretches where, uh, you know, I'll go a month or two months at a time without even having a proper conversation with people. Um, so, yeah, there was certainly a, a lack of human interaction, um, certainly in China. Um, but, yeah, uh, you just push through and, 
And compared to um, those people suffering around the world from cancer, I think, uh, yeah, what I'm doing, yes, there's, there's pain involved, uh, loneliness, um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's not uh, as bad as those suffering from cancer and, and uh, as, as my mum experienced. As a result of this interview, a lot of people are going to be looking at their bikes going, I could do that. What's the advice you give to people who are planning something similar to what you've just done? Well, probably um, just to start off small. I mean, like I said, I, I started off just a five day and, and then stumbled into a big epic uh, trip. Um, there's a term, you know, credit card tours. So, you know, you cycle along with just one bag, a change of clothes and, and your credit card and just swipe it from there uh, whenever you purchase something or stay in a hotel. Um, and there's also a lot of tour groups that, that set off. Um, so I'd, I'd probably recommend, um, yeah, just, just joining a little short trip, you know, in Bali or, or through Vietnam and uh, places where the terrain is quite flat if, if you're not fit or, or don't consider yourself much of a cyclist. And then you just work up from there. Um you know, there are people who have been cycling for years on the bike and um, at the end of the day, if, if, if you go for one week or if you go for two years, you've still got to carry all that luggage, um, you know, for all kinds of weather. So, um, I mean, when I hit winter, for example, I'd be cycling along with, you know, Gore-Tec gloves, thermals, balaclava, snow goggles, all this stuff. Um, so choose your climate and choose one that you're going to enjoy, uh, especially if it's around uh, vineyards and, and nice places with, uh, with wine. Uh, it's always nice to finish a day, pitch up the tent and enjoy a glass or two. Um, it makes you sleep well as well. I can imagine it does. Now, apart from showing off your skills on a bike and your ability to navigate from one side of the world to the other, this is a fundraiser for cancer research. So how do people in Adelaide contribute to your work? Uh, well, I've raised uh, about $23,000 now, and either um, just by meeting me on the street, they can pop a, a, a few coins in or a note uh, into the tin, but otherwise on my website, which is cyclingforcancer.com with a number four in the middle, um, and if you go onto my website, there's lots of different things there, and there's also a tab for um, the fundraising side of it uh, through the charity page, and you'll be able to donate online. Um, my trip is entirely uh, self-financed. I don't have any sponsorship, so any donations made actually go straight to the, uh, the charity, so... Um, yeah, um, running out of money now, um, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but hopefully, I get back to Sydney um, in time to, uh, yeah, to not being completely impoverished. Um, but yeah, any, anything donated uh, goes to the charity, and and like I said, they're they're funding projects all over the world. And and personally, I visited labs in in Greece and Finland, Australia now. And the work that's being done is absolutely fantastic. Uh, here here in Adelaide, you know, they're looking at. Uh, Cameron Bracken, the doctor here, is looking at the transition of cells uh, spreading across and, and causing secondary tumours in the body, while uh, Joanna Woodcott at South Australia University is looking at a particular type of protein and, and how that uh, regulates cell growth and survival. So, it, you know, these are these are absolutely crucial um, types of research into, into cancer. And uh, again, they're sharing this knowledge across the world with other scientists and progress is